Thank you all for being here with us at the Global Citizen Series. Our destination today is Malaysia. Before we start, I'd like to thank our sponsors and partners for today's event. Our appreciation goes out to gold sponsor PBB Hartabina, Symphony Life, UM Land, as well as silver sponsors Epson College, Garden International School, strategic partner Hatamas Real Estate, partner organizations also includes Malaysian Chamber of Commerce, Hong Kong and Macau, as well as top schools. Thank you for your support. Today, we'll be discussing moving to and starting a business in Malaysia, as well as property investments in international education. We'll also be hosting two virtual coffee chats, one on education and the other on startups after today's event. Please feel free to submit questions to our speakers via Q&A in our chat box on the right side of your screen. You can submit your questions at any time during the discussion, and we'll do our best to get them answered in the amount of time we have. To open this event, we're delighted to have Yap Wei Singh, the Consul General of the Consul General of Malaysia and Hong Kong, and Macau to say a few words to us. Distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, firstly, on behalf of the government of Malaysia, please allow me to extend my sincere appreciation to the South China Morning Post for organizing this Global Citizens episode on Malaysia. Thank you to the speakers and to everyone for joining us. I am honored to be asked to say a few opening words. Malaysia and Hong Kong are close partners and join strong ties in myriad fields. We enjoy robust trade and investment relations and cherished people-to-people -people ties. It is no wonder that many Hong Kongers call Malaysia home and as many as 20,000 Malaysians reside in the Pearl of the Orient. Malaysia is a beautiful, tropical, multiracial, multicultural and multireligious country. The shores of Peninsular Malaysia and the pristine beaches of Sabah and Sarawak in East Malaysia are parted by the South China Sea. Malaysia is one of the 17 mega diverse countries in the world and about 60% of the land is blanketed by lush forests, teeming with endemic species. Comprising 13 states and three federal territories and headed by the only elected constitutional monarch in the world, Malaysia is a vibrant and diverse parliamentary democracy with a population of about 33 million people. While English is commonly spoken, the official and national language is Bahasa Malaysia, Mandarin and various Chinese dialects, such as Cantonese, are also widely used. Home to a diverse group of races and religions, Malaysia is a melting pot of different cultures, languages, architecture and cuisine. Malaysia Truly Asia is one of the world's top tourist destinations, ASEAN's friendliest nation and one of Southeast Asia's most vibrant economies. We are aspiring to be at the forefront of quality education in the region. Kuala Lumpur is consistently ranked among the most affordable student cities in the world. We are also ranked the 20th most peaceful country by the Institute for Economics and Peace 2020 Global Peace Index, ranking higher than the Netherlands, the UK and Italy. Many may not know that Malaysia is gaining a strong reputation in its medical services, which is affordable and of international quality. In fact, we won first place in the International, international Medical Tourism Award for 2020, beating out South Korea. Ladies and gentlemen, I am grateful to the SCMP for organizing this webinar, which will generate greater awareness about some of Malaysia's strengths. That is our digital economy, property sector, education, and entrepreneurship, as well as many more. With that, I would like to reiterate my thanks to all involved. Thank you, and I wish you a fruitful afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Yap. The next session is Digital Economy, Malaysia as a Tech Hub, moderated by SEMP's business editor, Eugene Tang. Joining him on the panel are Kaling Ng, the managing partner at 500 Startups, Serena Sarik, the Chief Executive Officer at Malaysia Digital Economy Corporation, Dato Azman Mahmud, the Chief Executive Officer of Malaysian 
Investment Development Authority. They'll, they will share their insights and advice on what you should expect in doing business in and moving to Malaysia. Over to you, G Eugene. Hello. Hi. Hi, good afternoon and uh, welcome to the Global Citizen Series. Uh, hi, my name is Eugene. I'm coming to you from Hong Kong. And uh, this, this is a series that talks about the investing, uh, working and living around the world. And I'm very excited that today we are talking about Malaysia, my home country, or in uh, Bahasa, we call it my Tana Ae. Um, we are going to be talking about uh, the digital economy in, in, in Malaysia. Uh, first of all, a quick uh, housekeeping note. Um, our discussion will last roughly 30 minutes and we will be uh, taking questions from our members of our audience online. Um, they will be read to us uh, in the final 10 minutes or so of the session. Um, secondly, um, our typical audience profile is about 85% outside of Hong Kong, even though we are physically based here in Hong Kong. Um, given that this is roughly 2 a.m. in the United States, um, probably about 20% of our um, online audience right now we gather will be from Malaysia, roughly 20% from Singapore, probably, and uh, typically 15% of our online readership and audience will be from Hong Kong. So that gives you a broad idea of uh, who is watching our show. So let's get it going. And um, first of all, I'm going to apologize to Serena because I'm not going to be gentlemanly and I'm going to... I'm going to start the discussion with uh, Kylie Ng because he is an entrepreneur and he is um, the managing director of a startup, of, of a company that uh, invests in technology companies. And he is, his kampong is in Damansara in KL. So Kylie, welcome to the show. Um, please uh, tell us a few words of uh, self-introduction and tell us what attracted you to, first of all, start up your business in Kuala Lumpur, apart from the fact that it is your kampong? Yeah, uh, no, thanks for having me. And uh, good to see uh, Dato Asman and, and Serena, you know, good to be amongst friends, you know, on this panel. <laughs> so, um, yeah, a quick introduction. I, I feel like I lead two lives, right? One as a Malaysian, uh, having grown up here my uh, from going to a Chinese school, um, uh, Yu Hua Xia, all the way to a government school, SMK Damansara Jaya, doing my college here, but also my first life as a Malaysian building companies here as well. Uh, I built two businesses, one's a media company, which became the largest online news company in the country, which uh, was acquired by Media Prima, which is a media company here. Uh, and then also an e-commerce company that was acquired by Groupon, becoming one of the largest e-commerce players, not just in Malaysia, but in uh, all of, uh, uh, our team led all of the Asia operations as well. So uh, that first life as a Malaysian, but my second life in the past seven years have been primarily very global. Um, the, the venture capital firm that I operate now, uh, we are the most active investor globally in the world. Uh, and by not only by number of deals, but also by exits. We've invested in 2,400 companies in 76 countries. Uh, last year, my wife and I uh, took 261 flights. Okay, so we were hardly in Malaysia over the past few years. In fact, we were based in Jakarta for the most uh, uh, recent four years. So I guess like now, um, uh, coming back to Malaysia is quite uh, interesting, closer to parents. Uh, I must admit COVID brought me home, you know, so it's really fun to discuss uh, looking at um, Malaysia as a place for us to do business. I think, uh, Eugene, you had a second part to your question about uh, why did we uh, choose Malaysia for some of our operations. So I guess the first half of my life uh, kind of was a kind of part of the heritage of being here and the convenience of being here to create a business. Um, and I never found any issues actually creating a very large scalable tech businesses in Malaysia, you know, so things were very favorable and very natural as far as availability of talent, policies. And I must say, I give a big shout out to MDEC because I wouldn't have started my entrepreneurial career if MDEC never existed because they had certain grants and other things that we took advantage of that really helped propel us in the early days. Uh, that being said, now in my life as a global citizen, if you will, um, and with global venture capital, we do have uh, Malaysian support operations, data, legal, you know, and, uh, and, and some kind of venture capital operations here as well. And uh, the abundance of talent continues to be a big attraction point for us, you know, which is why we're, we're very, very, um, really benefiting a lot from being here. Okay, thank you very much, Kylie. We will come back to you later on and talk about some of the um, pain points that you may have uh, setting up business in Malaysia. Uh, I'd like to 
quickly go to Dr. Azman, uh, who represents uh, Maida. Um, and as his uh, backdrop says, the very first point of contact for foreign investors. So Dr. Azman, welcome to the show. Um, can you first of all explain to us how um, Maida exists uh, in relation to MDAC that we will go to later on? And what do you do in terms of um, what are some of the incentives and, and policies that you outline in terms of welcoming foreign investments to Malaysia? Robert, thank you very much for having me. Uh, and uh, welcome to my colleagues, uh, Serena and also Kylie. Uh, nice to see you online. Uh, we have not seen each other for uh, 10 months, I think. Yeah, it's been a while. Uh, yeah. And uh, let me start. Uh, uh, by uh, what Maida is all about. So Maida is, uh, as you can uh, heard from Eugene just now, is the first point of contact. Uh, we are represented throughout the world in 20 overseas centers uh, around the world where uh, technology and capital uh, is where we are uh, trying to get to uh, come and invest in Malaysia. And we have been around for the, for the past uh, 50, 50 years. Uh, and uh, since uh, the establishment, so we have the country has gone through uh, uh, three industrial master plan uh, in the industrial development, uh, and uh, it started with manufacturing actually, uh, and the key contributor, uh, uh, one I can uh, pick uh, one sector as the representative of the high tech sector in Malaysia is the e electrical electronic sector. Uh, which contributes about 90 billion US dollars of exports, uh, uh, which is about half of the total manufacturing exports. Uh, in comparison, the ENE &E, uh, sector is, uh, you know, contributing about 38% of the export values. So the evolution of the ENE &E sector actually uh, uh, has made Malaysia uh, to, uh, to be ranked number seven uh, in terms of export uh, of uh, high-tech products. Uh, and um, so this uh, sector, the companies in this sector has kept pace with by reinvesting in the state-of-the-art technology uh, and made manufacturing and its processes much more productive. Uh, so, so along the way, uh, there were uh, so many uh, online, uh, what do you call, uh, sorry, so many processes and uh, solutions in the manufacturing sector that evolve uh, and this include uh, uh, some of the digital tools, uh, platforms that we came to, to mediate, you know, the effect of the uh, COVID-19 such as social distancing and the movement control. So in fact, uh, uh, over the years, uh, uh, the transformation of the Malaysian economy has led to the government announcing uh, several initiatives, including the establishment of Multimedia Super Corridor and Multimedia Development Corporation, which is now headed by Surina. And uh, uh, evidence also by the multiple uh, public announcement on the National Strategic ICT Roadmap in 2008 uh, until 2012. And then we have National E-Commerce Strategic Roadmap in 2017. Uh, in 2018, uh, we had uh, industry forward uh, uh, policy, which is more of the, uh, focusing on the digitalization of the manufacturing sector. And also uh, the latest one being uh, the national fiberization and uh, connectivity plan uh, that is being introduced in 2019, uh, which is meant for uh, 2019 until 2023. So, uh, we talk about incentive. I, 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 uh, I think uh, there are so many incentives that have introduced, uh, 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 including the uh, those uh, companies that uh, are going to uh, to the MSC or Multimedia Super Corridor area, uh, and also other type of incentives which is uh, has been announced uh, recently, actually, uh, uh, which. Uh, I think I can share some of it here. Uh, for example, the National Panjana Fund for Startup uh, and, and also the Local Private Sector Venture Capital Fund. 
uh, the quantum is about 1.2 billion, uh, which is to uh, support the startup that will digitalize or digitize Malaysian businesses uh, and accelerate the economic recovery uh, uh, and also the uh, supported uh, by 600 million in foreign uh, private capital commitment. So this is being uh, being uh, uh, implemented uh, and I think uh, some announcement is going to be made very soon. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, it's, it's like fund of fund which is going to be uh, inviting the foreign venture capital and private equity uh, funds to uh, domicile in Malaysia. Uh, so others are like uh, uh, smart automation grant for SMEs. Uh, also, you know, talking about uh, adoption and uh, subscription of the digitalization services uh, uh, as well as uh, the tax incentive uh, uh, that uh, is going to be offered uh, uh, from zero tax rate for 10 years uh, for new investment uh, in manufacturing uh, uh, for investment between 300 to 500 million and then we have zero to zero tax rate for 15 years uh, for above 500 million uh, those are for manufacturing uh, but there are also uh, incentive for relocation uh, which is announced uh, this year in the recent budget uh, for relocation of services sector. Uh, and this is to focus on the uh, significant impact eh, uh, in terms of digital transformation of Malaysian businesses, uh, also technology transfer, uh, increase in export of services, uh, collaboration with the local institution in an industry in New York. So, uh, Within that uh, announcement, there is also a special income tax exemption at the rate of 15% for five years uh, to non-resident individual holding uh, key posts for companies with strategic investment uh, that relocate their business to Malaysia. So these are some of the uh, uh, initiative uh, mentioned. Uh, other than that, uh, we have uh, 500 million ringgit of uh, high technology fund to support high technology sector and innovative sector and then the special tax rate uh, for non-Malaysian individuals um, of a flat rate of 15 percent uh, uh, for the key positions in companies relocating uh, their operation to Malaysia and uh, for startup companies uh, the equity crowdfunding uh, is also uh, introduced to as an alternative funding to startup and 50% uh, tax exemption on the investment amount uh, uh, kept at 50,000 ringgit and an allocation of about 30 million matching grant uh, that to be invested uh, in this platform under the purview of the Securities Commission. So um, I, I think the, that is on, on incentive to answer your question, uh, uh, Eugene. Uh, but you. I think the overall Malaysia's investment proposition is the way the strong government policies in supporting, as I explained, you know, various policies and announcements were made, uh, you know, in to make the investment environment stronger and more attractive. Uh, and uh, over the years, government has invested a lot in infrastructure, including, you know, uh, this uh, digital uh, uh, infrastructure. Uh, education, as well as uh, uh, government has been trying to very hard to make the, the business environment uh, to be more uh, business friendly. And it has been business friendly because uh, now, uh, as of today, we have uh, more than 5,000 foreign investment, foreign companies that have made Malaysia their base and the startup community and the digital economy is uh, growing. Uh, Quite at a very healthy pace. Uh, the last that I heard is, uh, according to some study by YCP, uh, Solidens is about uh, worth about 270 billion ringgit, uh, which is about 18 percent of Malaysia's GDP. So I think I'll stop at that. Uh, maybe my 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 colleague Surina can add more to it.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Osman. So, uh, like you say, you are the first point of contact, and the uh, all this information is on the uh, website uh, behind you, the web address, www.mida.gov.my. Um, and you are and the so, big umbrella. Uh, Surina's website, MEMDAC. Ah, and, and MDAC. And you yes. are the big umbrella organization for everything, um, every aspect of foreign investments from let's say agriculture through to infrastructure, telecommunications and yes. so forth, right? Okay, let's um, zoom in on the digital economy. Um, Serena, you are the czar for digital investments. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, the recent budget, uh, 2021, you've got a 100 million ringgit budget to foster and develop digital economy. What are you going to do with that budget and what are some of the highlights? Okay, so thank you very, very much and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for having me here. And uh, thank you, Dr. Azman, for filling in the, um, the history because I was going to cover some of that, but you've covered that. Um, so, so quickly, I want to say, just to set the landscape, digital economy today accounts for about 19.1% of our economy. We think it's on track to be 20. That's our goal. Um, and this year, certainly, we've seen rapid growth. The government is fully, fully, fully committed to, to not just developing the digital economy, but accelerating uh, digital economy. And, and so uh, um, from, from our standpoint, there's many facets that we're very, very focused on to develop that. So when, you, when we think about digital economy, for example, Dr. Azman just now mentioned infrastructure. Of course, we're making large, large investments in that. But the other components that are needed are it's the skills component. And um, you also need business, uh, businesses, uh, digitally part businesses. So you need businesses on the tech side that are really providing those solutions. You also need businesses to adopt. And then you also need uh, business uh, continued investment in that. So from an MDEX standpoint, we, we are helping to, to coordinate and drive all these facets. And we work very closely with, with MIDA on the investment side because certainly we need continued investments in technology. Now, coming back to, to, to budget and as a way to, to demonstrate how commitment the, the, the committed the government is on this. So certainly the 100 million that you mentioned just now, that is really exclusively to continue to power our training and skilling programs. We've got a pretty wide agenda to make sure that, that um, um, our, our talent in the country is, is um, future savvy. Um, and so that's just one aspect of it. Another area that we're very focused on um, that, that uh, government has also provided um, um, some budget for that also is continuing the adoption of, of trade and e-commerce. Uh, today, you know, when you think about digital, when you think about business, um, it goes hand in hand with that. And we have a very, very large SME population and our mandate is to continue to make sure that they're, they're ready, which means from a tech opportunity standpoint, while we're doing all the hard work right now to educate and, and engage with maybe some of the, the, the uh, to, to enable SMEs, the more traditional SMEs along the digital journey, this means that there's plenty and plenty of opportunity for the startups and tech company to help provide that. And so I'll, I'll touch on, um, Dr. Azman just now mentioned Punjani Capital. So, so the government has, has um, um, via, via Punjani Capital, intends on injecting both private sector and government money liquidity into the market so that uh, VCs like Kylie and others can continue to help build the tech ecosystem so that we can um, uh, power, continue to power digital adoption. So I think overall, you know, um, I think we're firing on all cylinders here and it's really quite exciting times to be in Malaysia, who you mentioned truly Asia, well, we tend to think of ourselves as the heart of digital ASEAN. Thank you, Serena. Um, as you and uh, Dr. Azman have uh, painted, um, the Malaysian government is, uh, has been very generous um, in providing a very comprehensive um, and rather generous package to um, enhance, nurture and attract foreign investments. I want to come back to quickly to back to Kylie and, and sort of explore in your experience of actually working in, in Malaysia, and you have been, um, as been mentioned, you work very closely with uh, both MIDA and MDEC. What are some of the 
more persistent uh, pain points in your journey or in your experience as a tech entrepreneur in Malaysia? And are those pain points, can those pain points be addressed by some of the programs and incentives and plans that both Serena and Dado Azman have outlined? Or is, this something, is there something a little bit more fundamental? Uh, yeah, so so Eugene, I, I think the, the, the perspective I, I play today, uh, and I don't want to kind of misrepresent anyone because like, uh, so as a venture capital firm, uh, we operate in assembling portfolios uh, for our investors, right? So I am not a tech entrepreneur anymore per se, right? Like I represent a fund management company, if you will. So uh, a lot of my interactions have been with uh, global startups, regional startups, uh, as well as Malaysian startups as well. And so the kind of perspective is, is from that angle, first off. Uh, what, what I want to say is that like, I don't, the, the way I look at this question isn't about pain points and problems because um, even before I even started businesses, uh, there had been generations of very successful entrepreneurs operating large scale business here from Mark Chang, uh, building a regional company like Job Street all the way to um, having uh, Patrick Grove build multiple businesses with Katcha um, and so on and so forth. There have been a lot of like tech businesses that has used uh, Malaysia as a great place to grow and scale. And most recently, one of our portfolio companies, My Taxi, who became Grab, you know, they've continued to demonstrate that Malaysia can be a very key piece of a regional strategy. Now, with that in mind, um, what then, I guess, is the focal points of some of these efforts? I think that a lot of the efforts that both uh, Dato Azman as well as Serena had mentioned continues to kind of grow the ecosystem level. And these, th this is a bucket I call enabling strategy, right? They enable entrepreneurs to come here and do the things they want to do. What I think we're in the era, what I foresee we're in the era right now is competition between multiple countries uh, where all of them are pretty decent enablers, but we're entering an era of creative strategy. What do I mean? It means like it, it means like creating super projects, mega projects, if you will, that will assemble the force, the uniting force of many startups or maybe foreign investors to actually kind of create something very special, not for Malaysia, but how Malaysia creates something special for the world. So I think one example of this in the past from the old economy is that if you've got enabling strategy for say construction and infrastructure, that's cool. But if you've got creative strategy, you've built the Petronas Twin Towers. Creative strategy requires vision. It requires like an external facing, proactive, hands-on approach to actually shape new super projects. Now, as we enter the Industrial Revolution 4.0, with Malaysia being like a real contender in this, we have a lot of enabling strategy. Let's get into the era of, uh, enab uh, of creative strategy. And I think a lot of the mega projects, you know, I have been discussing some of them as it relates to venture capital, both with Serena as well with Dato Azman for like a global venture capital uh, uh, center of excellence here. So Malaysians can be trained and learn how to serve the global ecosystem of venture capital. Those are example projects of a more proactive, creative strategy. And I think that Malaysia has everything it takes to work with global players to discuss these strategies and see how they can come to fruition in a country like Malaysia. All right. Thank you. Um, when we talk, whenever we talk to um, companies, um, when we interview them for stories about uh, starting up something in in either Malaysia, KL, or, or Singapore, one of the um, gripes that we com constantly hear about is what they call the lack of talent. That the uh, talent pool is uh, too small. There are not many, not not enough project managers, there are not enough uh, software engineers, there are not enough uh, designers, or there are not enough uh, user interface designers who can bring global standard products or apps to, 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 to play. Yeah. How do we solve a problem like that? Okay, well, you know, the, the perspective is a very real perspective, but we also have to put that perspective in context. Because if you walk down Silicon Valley and talk to any Silicon Valley startup, they'll tell you the same thing. <laughs> you know, they're like, hey, we, can't, we, we need to get more UX designers, we need more iOS developers, or how about da big data, whatever. Anyone, you know, whether you're in Singapore, in Israel, or whatever, you know, like people, companies who are growing quickly, who are ambitious, they always are hungry for talent. And some of the region's largest companies, wh wh whether they've got offices in multiple Southeast Asian countries, they also have like development hubs for, requiring, uh, for recruiting programmers all the way. Like Grab, Grab had a development center in, in Seattle. You know, some, some of them have development centers in Bangalore. Ambition requires appropriate resourcing. And so any kind of ambitious startup will always require more, more and more talent wherever it may be. 
So I think the question then becomes flipped: is that either you, you it, either you are so ambitious and you have you're so resourced that you're hungry for talent that you are sucking up global talent, right? That's like bucket A or bucket B. You are really terrible at hiring, so it's easier to blame the ecosystem and blame people around you because you you just haven't invested in building a very repeatable brand for hiring, right? Or the third bucket is that you're not good at talent development. I think some of the companies who succeed the most, they not only have talent recruitment as one function, but talent development and continuous education. And the world's largest tech companies invest a lot in developing their own homegrown talent. So I, I would uh, uh, invite a more proactive approach to actually talent, um, talent creation, right? So hence, I think a lot of the mega projects I discuss with various governments and particularly with Dato Asman and Serena and other Malaysian stakeholders is that of a proactive approach to actually being, to providing talent for the world. There's no reason why Malaysia can't have like a million tech workers in five years. There's no reason why. Like there's enough brains over here. And, and, and if we have a very focused effort towards doing that, I think we can make that happen. So we be, it would be great to have an oversupply of tech talent, you know, and I think all that is possible for Malaysia and, and for a lot of countries who are willing. Thank you, Kylie. Uh, Serena, uh, I see you. Um, sorry, you you are on on mute. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Is this something that your skills training program can address? Yes. And so, so um, um, uh, the answer is we're working on on that. But in addition to that, I just wanted to say, in order to continue to to draw visibility to this, there are some things that we're already doing to address that. So, for example, Kylie talks about enabling the the, the talent, and so. To date, for example, we've been working very closely with the universities, and what we have over here now is is a, a um, uh, what we call the premier digital tech institution, where the where the curriculum, the experience, the uh, these these universities are working very closely with industry and outcomes talent. They get snapped up right away. Um, that's one. We're also investing in alternative talent development programs, for example, Ecole 42, the, where um, um, I'm sure you, you know some of you may have heard of that um, from, from, um, from Paris. So they've opened up um, KL 42. And so this is another example where, where we're enabling um, accelerated digital um, uh, talent development for that. And another, another facet that's required is the building up of the community. Sometimes with talent, especially tech talent, they're dispersed everywhere. You don't know where they are. They are around. Um, but what we're trying to do also is draw up the community aspect of it. So one of the things that we're doing, that we have is our Malaysia digital hubs where all the startups tend to percolate and so you can start to see all the talent there. Uh, we started with seven digital hubs. Now we've got 20 and we continue to draw visibility around that. And then of course, you know, the, the um, uh, we will continue to invest in, in skilling programs. Um, certainly next year is a big agenda for, for that. Thank you. Thank you, Serena. Now, I want to... Th We've got some very interesting background music um, going on uh, online. Um, I want to uh, quickly throw out a, a question. Now, I'm old enough to remember the Multimedia Super Corridor. Um, many, many years ago when this was, when this was uh, uh, rolled out, this was all the rage. And, and now it's uh, under Serena's uh, uh, purview. So that congratulations. Now, I also saw this um, very interesting uh, statistic where somebody said that one in three, the, the, the level of digitization among uh, small and medium enterprises in Malaysia is about roughly about one third. Is that true? Um, is it, what does that reflect? Does it reflect the fact that um, there's a lot more work to do or is digitalization something which is so far removed from the everyday um, uh, livelihood and businesses of small and medium enterprises. Is it irrelevant? In other words? Not irrelevant at all. So, so I'll, um, I'll, I'll answer it two parts. So number one, when we talk about digitalization, digitalization itself has a broad meaning. So for example, if a company has a website, does that count as digitalization? Or does it count all the way when they start having like AI systems to run their, their customer targeting? So it's a very broad um, metric over there. Um, but but on one metric, and so certainly when I started, you know, um, if we just measure the number of companies, number of SMEs that had 
websites, but we're able to art actually have an online presence. Yes, the number was something like that. And and back in 2019, companies were SMEs and were were looking around and thinking digital is optional, and so that's where you have statistics like that. However. What we found this year is that all the SMEs, you know, through our surveys, I wouldn't say all, most SMEs now they realize it's no longer an option. And so they're all talking about how. So how do we digitalize? What do we do next? So for example, today when you talk about SMEs having at least a digital presence, i.e. you start with digital marketing, you've got, you know, you, you're leveraging Facebook, you're doing social selling and all that, the numbers are actually quite higher. In fact, one survey that we had when we ran um, our SME Digital Summit uh, a couple months ago, you know, 80% of our SM micro SMEs already had established a digital presence, which means they're starting already on that journey. So now the work has to continue to make sure that they start to, they continue to digitalize and not just the front end, but the middle office and the back office as, as, as well. And so, so working with Mida, for example, on the manufacturing side, you know, these companies need to really start thinking about, about how do you then digitalize your business process? And that's really where we are right now. Right. It's really about making use of the latest technology to change and enhance the business model, right? Mm, we, that's right. We, we, one, of the, one of the favorite stories that we, we uh, very popular stories that we did last year was about how some farmers in Malaysia were able to export their durians uh, via Alibaba's uh, Taobao yes, to, uh, right. to, 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 to China. So you've got uh, Chinese consumers who are able to get their hands on the latest uh, you know, harvest of Mao Shang Wan or whatever through Taobao. What is this music? <laughs> through, 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 through Taobao. So, and, and that digital presence has really transformed the way um, that farmers work or the, 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 the durian farmers who benefited from this, how they work in Malaysia. Yeah, it sounds like a didgeridoo. I think it's like an Australian instrument. <laughs> I don't know where it sounds coming from. Oops, now we're all on, now, now we're all on mute. So, sorry, let me, let me struggle with this one second. And we, we can hear you. Okay. And yeah, we can hear you. what I wanted, what I, what I wanted to say was, um, digitalization, uh, we really are talking about how, uh, technology, uh, the use of, um, things like AI or, uh, big data, uh, computing, cloud computing, all these can be brought to bear to change and transform the way uh, businesses sell, market, uh, even the way businesses, companies do business, right? Um, they can discover new things and then they can, and they can um, not, just, not just the selling part of it or the marketing part of it, but the way they uh, conduct, right? That's what, that's what we're really talking about. Yep, that's exactly it. So you're digitizing your your front process, how you engage with your customers. You're digitizing your off your business process, and you're also innovating. And so, how do you leverage the latest and greatest technology to come up with new business models? How do you leverage AI? How do you leverage all these four IR technologies that we're talking about out there? Okay. In that, but, case, uh, in, uh, can I just expand sure. a little bit more uh, on uh, what was touched by uh, by Surina? Uh, uh, the, I mentioned earlier that uh, Malaysia has started the industry forward uh, initiative. Uh, actually, it, what it, it entails is to encourage the industries, particularly the manufacturing sector, which has a very deep and wide uh, ecosystem uh, and supply chain uh, uh, anchored by many multinationals in Malaysia. So. Um, this uh, initiative by the government is to encourage uh, our uh, industries to adopt uh, this uh, industry forward and industry 4.0. So meaning that you know, the solution uh, for, uh, of AI and automation and uh, all the digital platforms that support and solve uh, problems uh, or improve processes uh, 
uh, within the at least in the manufacturing and logistics sector is is going to be uh, a big uh, uh, industry in Malaysia. So uh, this is the second year that we have impl implemented this, and uh, uh, the initiative is going to transform uh, thousands of uh, companies, uh, including the SMEs uh, within the manufacturing sector as well as the the uh, uh, manufacturing related services. So this is to add on the bucket of opportunities to the SMEs that was mentioned by Serena just now uh, that will create that opportunity in Malaysia. So with all the government support announced so, uh, so far, uh, it will create that uh, a nice ecosystem that will attract uh, many startup uh, companies uh, to to domicile here, as well as uh, uh, to be to make Malaysia as, as a launching pad or test pad uh, before it is launched uh, to at least the region or other part of the world. So, Dato, I like you to elaborate a little bit on that, if if, if you can. Um, here, here in Hong Kong or or in China, when we talk about smart manufacturing. Um, Often uh, they talk about the Made in China 2020, 2025 uh, master plan, for example. Uh, when they talk about smart manufacturing, we talk about we, we, what we refer to is actually um, consumers and their direct feedback, real-time feedback to manufacturers. They can impact in the way that manufacturers change and change their designs or change their, their, their product based on real-time feedback from consumers. Is that what you're referring to? Well, that is that is part of it, uh, but uh, you know, uh, I believe uh, that is a portion of the whole chain. Uh, it can be um, uh, what you call because this uh, industry from zero involves people and process at least, you know, and then there are many pillars uh, in the industry from zero. It's nine, ten, you know, from automation to ERP to uh, artificial intelligence and all that. Uh, so it, it cut across uh, what we call the whole chain, uh, even from starting from the design, uh, prototyping, uh, to manufacturing the process until the, the, uh, at the end. So these are the opportunities that we are talking about. And uh, as you may have noticed, uh, this manufacturing sector is about a quarter of the total GDP. And uh, it's an export oriented, so it's not only about 13 million population, so it's about you know 100 of countries that, that we are serving, and we are part of the global supply chain. So, so the, the uh, what we call magnitude of the digital opportunities in this uh, uh, space that I mentioned, uh, there are many fronts, right? I want to, I also want to use this opportunity to ask a quick question, uh, coronavirus. The pandemic how has that changed uh, manufacturing um, again using the china example um, china used to be known as the factory to the world uh, along came the coronavirus pandemic you had the factories shut down across multiple cities and all of a sudden the um, the knock-on effect on uh, factories in japan south korea europe uh, tremendous so Global manufacturers are moving from this just-in-time kind of a supply chain into what we call just-in-case. Um, put your eggs in multiple baskets, so to speak. So is Malaysia or Southeast Asia benefiting from this shift from just-in-time to just-in-case? Uh, well, this, thank you. Uh, this is a very, very good question. Uh, and uh, I, I think, uh, let me talk about... Uh, the approach that Malaysia has taken, you know, uh, number one, uh, we want the people to be safe, but also at the same time, we want to maintain the livelihood of the people. So the approach is while we try to manage the and contain the spread of the disease, the, the government has uh, also decided that the economy should not be uh, what they call affected. Uh, and uh, probably we will have the initial stage uh, because uh, uh, not many countries, even Malaysia, we don't have any experience to handle such a crisis. So the initial stage, uh, the manufacturers were limited to essential items only. But then uh, we realized that uh, this is not the right approach. Then slowly the government has allowed uh, factories and the supply chain 
and the supporting uh, industries to to operate. So so that has been uh, the backdrop uh, and the uh, uh, what they call approach that Malaysia has taken. And uh, this has helped, uh, you know, the at least the uh, supply chain within the manufacturing sector and some of the support services uh, is not much uh, disrupted. As you can see from the exports of nation uh, numbers, uh, we are not that uh, affected in terms of export oriented industries. So, um, so, not, so knowing that uh, Malaysia is open for business, there's no disruption. So we have actually, to answer your question, benefited uh, quite a bit in terms of uh, uh, investment uh, that uh, we have seen coming in. And in fact, uh, as of the third quarter this year, we are seeing uh, a, a total investment of about 65 billion ringgit. Uh, and it is a, uh, a, 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 what we call a percentage that is higher uh, than uh, 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 say the same period for 2019 and uh, actually when we say Malaysia is uh, the part of the global supply chain we are open to business to everyone uh, to manage the just in case situation that you mentioned uh, to have a, a supply a chain uh, that can uh, operate uh, within uh, the uh, you know this environment and uh, so far, we are, we are seeing uh, uh, a good uh, reaction from the invest investment community. And I hope that the, the, the technology part, the technology uh, segment also uh, will follow suit because uh, we are open for business actually. Even if you want to come and visit Malaysia, we just uh, apply through MAIDA and we will uh, you know, work with the Ministry of Health uh, under our one-stop center for tra business travelers to come and evaluate uh, Malaysia as a place to invest. And this is done uh, uh, in a very expedition uh, way. We, in fact, the approval is within three days, you know, to, to get uh, the visa to come in and, and meet your business partners or potential investors. Whatnot. Thank you. Again, the website is www.mida.gov.my. Um, Eva is uh, furiously uh, signaling to me, so I think that's about the time that we have. Thank you very much uh, for um, appearing on the show. Um, I will hand the time back to Eva. Uh, thank you, Eugene, Dato, Serena, and Kylie for your valuable insights. Unfortunately, like Eugene said, that's all the time we have.